panel which now addresses the literary foundations of early German Romanticism. We have two speakers. The first one is well known to all of you since he is one of our hosts, namely Professor Michael Forster. Since March 2013, Michael Forster is Humboldt Professor at Bonn University and has a chair for theoretical philosophy. His research mainly focuses on German philosophy, ancient philosophy, epistemology, and philosophy of language. Michael Forza is the author of many articles and books. I just want to pick out some of his monographs, among them Hegel and Skepticism, Wittgenstein on the Arbitrariness of Grammar, After Herder, Philosophy of Language in the German Tradition, German Philosophy of Language from Schlegel to Hegel and Beyond, Die Aktualität der Romantik, and recently published the Oxford Handbook of German Philosophy in the 19th century. Since many of, sorry, co-edited with Christian Gestahl, our second speaker of this panel. Um, since many of the participants of this conference have contributed entries to this huge volume, Michael Forster asked me to hand this out to you so you can have a look during the talk. Yes, you've seen it. Today, Michael Forster is going to talk about historicizing genre, the German romantic rethinking of ancient tragedy. So, thank you all very much for being here. I, I, I should also, since uh, Stefan mentioned the, the, the Humboldt professorship, thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for funding this whole event uh, so generously. Um, so this, is, uh, this uh, talk, uh, which is going to be somewhat compressed like all the talks are, uh, is dealing with various, various topics, the genre theory, um, the contribution of Herder and the Romantics to it, um, a question of the priority of uh, Friedrich and uh, August Wilhelm Schlegel in their contributions will be in play too. And finally, a lesson for the, or a set of lessons for uh, contemporary philosophy of language. Uh, so all of these things will be in play in one way or another. Um, Aristotle was uh, probably the first thinker to theorize about genre in any detail, namely in his poetics. There he considers genre as a poetic or literary phenomenon, epic, lyric, tragedy, and comedy are his focus. Um, as one can see from his treatment of the genre of tragedy in particular, he seems to conceive genres as consisting roughly in a set of general rules and purposes governing a work's constitution, for example, in the case of tragedy, rules about mimesis of an action, language, and enactment, together with the purpose of catharsis. He apparently believes that correctly identifying a work's genre is essential uh, both for properly interpreting and for properly evaluating the work. And he evidently thinks of genres as fundamentally unique. For example, there's one and only one genre of tragedy. This is probably how most people still think of genre even today. But beginning in the 18th century, Aristotle's model underwent significant modification among some thoughtful theorists. The first two parts of the model, constitution by rules and purposes, importance for interpretation and evaluation, were broadly retained. But the third part of the model, uniqueness, came under attack. Genre became historicized. Interestingly enough, the seminal move here seems to have been made by a thinker who's, not, who's normally regarded as the very opposite of a historicist rather as a believer in universal shared by all historical periods and cultures, namely Voltaire. However, that impression of Voltaire really derives from his later works, such as the uh, Philosophie de l'Histoire from 1765. In his earlier works, he seems to have been much more in sympathy with a long tradition of French thinkers, such as Montaigne, Lamotte Levé, and the young Montesquieu of the Lettre Pazin, who had already developed a vision of deep historical and cross-cultural differences. Accordingly, in his early Essay sur la Poésie Epique from 17, uh, 1728, 
Voltaire argued that literary genres constantly change or vary from one epoch or culture to another. Uh, in particular, he argues that the various examples of epic that have emerged over the course of history, for example, Homer, Virgil, Milton, and so on, and Voltaire himself in the Henriade, and the various examples of tragedy, and I use scare quotes in both these cases, that have occurred, for example, those of Sophocles, Corneille, Racine, Shakespeare, and so on, have in each case been very different in kind from each other. So there's just an, an illusion of a single genre in each case. In Germany, Herder continued this line of thought and developed it further. Thus, in the Critical Forests from 1769, he himself argued that different peoples and their authors have produced very different types of epic poetry. And in the same work, and then more elaborately in the essay Shakespeare from 1773, he argued, contrary to a common assumption, that tragedy has a single essence that has already, had, has already been defined by Aristotle, that the genre rules and purposes that constitute ancient tragedy are in fact sharply different from those that constitute Shakespearean tragedy. So that despite sharing the same name, the genres involved are really very different. He writes, Sophocles' drama and Shakespeare's drama are two things which in a certain sense scarcely share the same name. Uh, later in the Letters for the Advancement of Humanity, Herder sums up this whole line of thought succinctly uh, by covering all literary genres. Um, I'll skip the quotation. Herder supports this thesis with detailed comparisons. For example, concerning tragedy, in the essay Shakespeare, he either argues or at least implies that whereas ancient tragedy normally observed the unities of action, time, and place, <coughs> Shakespearean tragedy routinely violates them, that whereas ancient tragedy includes a chorus and music, Shakespearean <coughs> does not, that whereas ancient tragedy requires its main protagonist to have a relatively high moral stature, Shakespearean does not, of course, Richard III, who's, I gather, being reburied uh, as we speak, um, is uh, a, a good example. That whereas ancient tragedy accords a, certain, a central place to recognition scenes, Shakespearean does not. That whereas ancient tragedy strictly excludes comedy, Shakespearean admits it. An example would be the grave diggers in Hamlet, for example. And that whereas ancient tragedy had uh, Dionysian religious functions and civic political functions, Shakespearean tragedy lacks them. Moreover, Herder pushes this whole line of thought concerning literature even further in a certain way. He argues that even within a particular culture and period, um, tragedy can be different between one author and another. Indeed, even within a single author, it, one of his works can be a tragedy of a different sort from another. Uh, Shakespeare would be a case in point. This whole position concerning literature leads Herder to draw some very important consequences about both the interpretation and the critical evaluation of literature. A first is that due to such historical, cultural, and in some cases even individual variations, a work's genre will often initially be unfamiliar to an interpreter or critic, so that he will need to undertake a careful investigation of it in order to identify it correctly, and hence in order either to understand or to critically evaluate the work in question properly. Accordingly, Herder himself devotes considerable attention to just such investigations of relatively unfamiliar genres, for example, Shakespearean tragedy in the essay Shakespeare and uh, ancient Hebrew poetry in its various forms in On the Spirit of Hebrew Poetry, about which Kristen's about to talk. One important part of Herder's position here is that a genre is always rooted in a specific cultural context from a specific time and place, and that therefore, in order to identify the genre correctly, one needs to understand it in relation to that cultural context. Another important part of his position is that the identity of a genre, in a strict sense of that term, can normally only be fully determined in light of the historical origin and diachronic de development of the genre, in a looser sense of that term, that generated it. For example, the identity of Shakespearean tragedy in light of the origin and development of tragedy that eventually led up to it. A second consequence is that interpreters and critics face constant temptations falsely to assimilate a work's genre to some other genre with which they happen to be more familiar. 
based on the superficial similarity of a shared name and a few uh, other uh, uh, relatively superficial shared features. Temptations to which they've often succumbed, thereby vici vitiating both their understanding and their critical evaluation of works. For example, in the essay Shakespeare, Herder argues that French interpreters and critics of Shakespeare have falsely assimilated Shakespeare's genre of tragedy to what, according to Herder, Aristotle already correctly identified as the ancient genre of tragedy, whereas in fact the two genres are importantly different. And he argues that French interpreters and critics have consequently both misunderstood Shakespearean tragedy and gone astray in their critical assessments of it critical assessments which, on the one hand, fault it for failing to fulfill certain genre purposes and rules that do not in fact belong to its genre at all, especially the three unities, and which, on the other hand, fail to commend it for successfully fulfilling the genre purposes and rules that really do constitute its genre. Another important contribution that Herder makes to the theory of genre concerns the appropriate method to use in order to uh, determine a work's genre. Um, the situation I've been describing, you know, a plethora of different genres all sharing the same name and a few other relatively superficial common features, together with the resulting challenges of needing to identify unfamiliar genres and needing to avoid, avoid false assimilation, was first recognized by Herder thanks to his use of an empirical approach to determining genre. But likewise, he sees an empirical approach as the key to surmounting the challenges that this situation involves. In this spirit, he already enjoins in 1764 to 5 that in constructing our aesthetic theories, we should begin not from the top, but from the bottom. We take a, an empirical approach, looking at the evidence closely before advancing theoretical claims. Accordingly, he strongly rejects a priorism in this area. One aspect of this is a value, very salutary, I think, avoidance of the sort of a priori schemas of possible genres that had been developed before him by certain theorists, John of Garland, for example, would soon be developed afterwards by uh, Goethe in the uh, Westerstliche Divan, for example, and uh, in some moods by Friedrich Schlegel, and that had been developed in ever more complicated versions by 20th century uh, writers on genre, Fry and Scholes, for example. Another aspect of Herder's rejection of a priorism in this area lies in his rejection of a priorism in determining the character of particular genres, specific genres. He certainly rejects what you might call the absolute a priorism of, of trying to discover the character of a particular genre without closely observing examples of it at all, say on the basis of what Aristotle has told us a tragedy ought to be. But he re also rejects what you might call the relative a priorism of trying to discover the character of a particular genre by closely observing only some limited range of examples of it without closely observing further examples to which the resulting genre conception is to be applied in interpretation and or critical assessment. Even this sort of procedure is disastrous in his view due to the fact that the superficial appearance of a single genre shared by different historical periods or cultures, or even by, single, by different authors within a single period and culture, or indeed even by a single author in one work of his and in another, typically masks important differences, so that inductions from a limited range of examples as often as not mislead. Herder detects such a misguided a priorism in the determination of particular genres in many areas of interpretation and criticism, uh, for example, the typical French critic's approach to Shakespearean tragedy. I'll go over the detail, skip over the details of that. Um, more positively, Herder's alternative empirical approach to determining a genre is a multifaceted one. First and foremost, it includes careful observation and analysis of the relevant works themselves in order to discover the genre purposes and rules that are operative within them, as you might expect. But as I've also already implied, it also normally includes, in his view, consideration of the cultural context of the genre in question and of the origin and diachronic development of a more loosely defined genre to which it belongs and which generated it. In addition, at least in principle, it includes the consideration of theoretical discussions of the genre by the relevant author or his contemporaries. Incidentally, this sort of empir uh, methodological empiricism 
in relation to genre uh, coheres with a more general methodological empiricism in Her Hegel's hermeneutic theory and indeed in his philosophy uh, over, overall. Finally, Herder also makes an additional very important move about genre. He extends the concept of genre and his whole historicist theory of genre from its initial application to linguistic forms of art, uh, literature, so as to cover also non-linguistic forms of art, such as sculpture. Uh, thus, having initially developed the whole position I've just described in relation to epic and tragedy in The Critical Forest from 1769 and the essay Shakespeare from 77, 1773, he then immediately goes on to apply it to portrait sculpture as well in this tour of philosophy of history for the formation of humanity, 1774, which is concerned with Greek versus uh, Pharaonic Egyptian portrait sculpture. I'll skip over the details of that uh, perfectly parallel treatment of sculpture uh, in the interest of saving some time. In the generation immediately after Herder, the most important continuers of the new historicist theory of genre were the romantics Friedrich and August Wilhelm Schlegel. The Schlegel brothers did not, it seems to me, make any significant progress beyond Herder in the general theory of genre. Insofar as they deserve praise in that area, it's rather just for upholding his principles. But they did develop some very important new applications of the theory. Certain of Friedrich Schlegel's scattered and often inconsistent remark, general remarks on genre in fact tend to contradict Herder's general principles and seem to me decidedly retrograde. Peter Sondi has made a, a lot of these remarks and uh, except for his misguided enthusiasm for them, uh, has given quite an accurate survey of them. They include ideas, for example, about um, the need to overcome genre, uh, the transhistorical character of certain genres, a deductive approach or a priorist approach to genres being required, and a hierarchy among genres. However, Friedrich's more considered and better position about genre instead sustains Herder's general pr central principles. Uh, an especially important text for this superior side of his thinking about genre is the set of lectures on German language and literature that he delivered in Cologne in 1807. August Wilhelm likewise upholds G Herder's general principles about genre, but even more consistently and, and emphatically than his brother. For example, in his justly famous course of lectures on dramatic art and literature from 1809, which is indeed in many ways just a sort of grand reworking and elaboration of Herder's seminal essay, Shakespeare. However, if the Schlegels were little more than followers of Herder in the general theory of genre, they made some very important new applications of Herder's theory. One of these new applications involved drawing a sharp distinction between classical and romantic poetry and making a case that the latter is as valid as the former moves which constituted the very birth of German Romanticism. I've discussed that move in an art, a published article, so I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that here. What I'm going to talk about is a second case, namely an application concerning ancient tragedy. Unlike, uh, the Sch until the Schlegels came along, the understanding of ancient Greek tragedy as a genre had been dominated by Aristotle's poetics which had been considered virtually sacrosanct not only among French dramatists and critics but also uh, among their main German opponents, Lessing and Herder. The dispute between the two sides for the most part took for granted that Aristotle's position was correct and merely concerned what exactly it was, what exactly it meant. However, this all changed with the Schlegels. Thanks to their new Herderian sensitivity to the difficulty of penetrating genres from remote periods and cultures, and in particular to the acute danger of falsely assimilating them to more familiar genres, together with a, a skilled and scrupulous investigation of the evidence supplied by the surviving ancient tragedies themselves, conducted in the spirit of Herder's empirical approach to identifying genres. Thanks to this, the Schlegels came to realize that Aristotle's account of ancient tragedy is in fact at least as much an obstacle to properly understanding it as an aid. And in the work where uh, Friedrich Schlegel first uh, 
opens that theme, makes that, uh, raises that idea. Uh, he pays tribute to Herder. He says the Germans have brought about an entirely new and incomparable, incomparably higher level of study of the Greeks. Instead of the many names that could be given here, uh, only one will be mentioned. Herder joins the most extensive knowledge with the most delicate feeling and the most supple sensitivity. The Schlegels, uh, by making these moves, made this move made possible, and indeed themselves began, a great wave of fresh theorizing about the nature of ancient tragedy that continued in the 19th century, especially with Hegel and Nietzsche, and which still continues apace today, for example, in the works of Vernon, uh, Vidal Naquet, uh, Zeitlin, Winkler, Easterling, uh, Easterling and Goldhill, to name some of the major researchers. Let me try to sketch the Schlegel's attack on Aristotle's account of Greek tragedy. It was Friedrich who began the attack, established its central principles, and I think had the deeper insights. So let's begin with him. Friedrich already attacked Aristotle's claim to be a real authority on Greek poetry in honest, On the Study of Greek Poetry, a seminal text from 1795 uh, with a famous preface added in 1797. And he did so largely on the plausible ground that Aristotle belonged to the period of uh, Greek poetry's decadence and consequently misunderstood its most important earlier forms. Then in another work on, the, on Homeric poetry from 1796 and in the first and only completed volume of his History of the Poetry of the Greeks and Romans from 1798, which mainly deals with epic poetry, but which was to have been followed by a second volume on tragedy. Uh, Friedrich had already read, written a huge manuscript on ancient tragedy by this time. Friedrich developed a more, it's lost since, unfortunately. Friedrich developed a more extensive and careful account critique of Aristotle's views about epic and tragedy. In particular, he argued that Aristotle assimilated the two genres far too closely especially in connection with the so-called unity of action. Specifically, he argued that Aristotle failed to see that the two, genres, the two genres involve fundamentally different sorts of unity, whereas the sort involved in tragedy is strict, that involved in epic is much looser, whereas in tragedy it requires following just a single human action or plan from its inception through to its conclusion, in epic it does not, whereas in tragedy it requires that none of the events included in a work could have been omitted and non-added without destroying the unity involved. In epic, it does not. Whereas in tragedy, it requires that both the beginning and the end of the plot be quite definitely determined. In epic, these are only rather, rather arbitrarily chosen in relation to a larger background of myth that extends both backwards and forwards in time from the events depicted, and so on. These are the differences between the types of unity involved. Friedrich also, at this early period, began to problematize Aristotle's uh, doctrine of tragedy's uh, unity of action itself, and by implication, the neo-Aristotelian neo doctrine of the three unities of action, time, and place. Additionally, in these early works, Friedrich, continuing a theme already adumbrated by Herder, emphasized that tragedy had a deeply religious, and in particular Dionysian character, which Aristotle, despite acknowledging the beginnings of tragedy in the Dionysian Dithyram, had neglected or even suppressed. Friedrich also in these early works, again continuing a theme already adumbrated by Herder, recognized that tragedy had a deeply civic political character, and in particular a deeply liberal republican character, thereby going far beyond Aristotle's vague suggestions at the end of the politics, that poetry serves purposes of education, catharsis, and entertainment within the polis. Perhaps most radically of all, Friedrich also argued in certain places that tragedy, instead of being intended to be fictional concerning, broadly speaking, historical matters, all the things that have existed, gods, humans, heroes, what have you, all the, things, the properties they've had, all of the things they've done, and so on, as Aristotle had implied, was actually intended to be historically factual. August Wilhelm, Wilhelm, in his History of Classical Literature from 1802 and Course of Lectures on Dramatic Art and Literature from 1809, radically rejected Aristotle's account as well, continuing and elaborating most of Friedrich's claims, 
while also disagreeing with Friedrich on certain points in ways that made his critique of Aristotle more extreme in certain respects and less so in others. Concerning first the continuities and elaborations, August Wilhelm essentially repeated Friedrich's insistence against Aristotle that epic and tragedy were deeply different genres, in particular because they strove for very different sorts of unity. In this connection, he introduced an illuminating and justly famous sculptural analogy. Epic is like the classical frieze, for example, the friezes on the Parthenon, but tragedy more like the sculptural group, for example, the Laocoon group. August Wilhelm also continued Friedrich's problematizing of Aristotle's doctrine of the unity of action in tragedy itself and of the neo-Aristotelian doctrine of the three unities of action, time, and place, elaborating on Friedrich's position by arguing that Aristotle really only espoused one of the three unities uh, traditionally attributed to him, namely that of action, not those of time or place, that even his doctrine of the unity of action is obscure in its proper import, and that the unities of time and place are in fact quite, pro quite commonly and properly violated by Greek tragedies. August Wilhelm also repeated Friedrich's insistence against Aristotle that tragedy was deeply religious, and in particular Dionysian. Finally, August Wilhelm also repeated Friedrich's insistence that tragedy had deep civic political, and in particular liberal republican functions, developing this point more fully than Friedrich had yet done in relation to the nature of the tragic chorus. However, August Wilhelm also disagreed with Friedrich on some important issues. For one thing, he contradicted Friedrich's conception that tragedy was meant to be thoroughly factual rather than fictional about, again broadly, historical matters. For another thing, he took a significantly different position from Friedrich concerning Aristotle's theory that tragedy's main function was a catharsis of pity and fear. Friedrich seems, at least initially, to have been sympathetic to this theory, and he never explicitly contradicted it. By contrast, August Wilhelm flatly claimed that it was false. The Schlegel's uh, joint attack on Aristotle, Aristotle's account of uh, Greek tragedy set the agenda for subsequent research on Greek tragedy and has in general been richly vindicated by it. For example, this is true of their insistence against Aristotle on the deeply religious and in particular Dionysian origin and nature of tragedy, which has since been supported not only by Nietzsche's brilliant but rhapsodic The Birth of Tragedy, but also by more sober and painstaking recent scholarship. It's also true that of their insistence against Aristotle on the deeply civic political, and in particular republican character of tragedy, which has likewise been richly confirmed by scrupulous recent scholarship. And it's also true of their criticism of the uh, neo-Aristotelian doctrine of the unities, criticism, criticisms which have indeed since become a virtual commonplace in the scholarship on ancient tragedy. Finally, concerning the two issues that divided uh, Friedrich and August Wilhelm, the question of whether classical tragedy was intended by its authors to be historically fictional or factual, and the question of whether or not it was intended to serve the function of catharsis, um, as I've argued in detail in another essay, it's Friedrich who had the deeper insights here. Contra Aristotle, classical tragedy was indeed intended to be historically factual at least until Euripides and Agathon. This is already strongly suggested by its descent from epic poetry, where divine inspiration by the muses was understood to guarantee the historical truth of the poet's account, uh, the introduction to the catalogue of ships in the Iliad Big Book II, where the, a, a reappeal, re a, a, a renewed appeal is made to the muses to help the poet get his account historically right, is paradigmatic for this stance. And it's confirmed also by the fact that Plato, who stood markedly close to the great tragedians than Aristotle, both chronologically and in terms of his social milieu, he even started his career aspiring to be a tragedian, in the Republic accuses the tragedians not only of moral corruption, but also of communicating historical falsehoods about the gods, about the heroes, and what have you. An accusation which only makes sense on the assumption that they purported to convey historical truths. Make no, no, sense, no sense would be like, you know, 
if, if, it, if he thought that tragedy were fictional, it would be, his criticism would have all the force of saying, for example, of a Jane Austen novel, but those things actually didn't happen, Jane. <laughs> um, um, and, a form of cath uh, and a form of catharsis, to turn to the second issue that divides Friedrich and August Wilhelm, a form of catharsis was indeed an important part of the function of classical tragedy, namely in virtue of its status as a Dionysian rite, because Dionysian rites generally had such a function, temporarily, temporarily encouraging and releasing impulses that were potentially disruptive to society in the interest of thereby removing or taming them. As you can see, for instance, from Euripides' Bacchae, where the participant in the ritual ecstatic revelries of Dionysus, like in the mountains up above uh, Delphi, for example, is said to participate in them hosiois kathamoisin, that's the word of the same word as catharsis, of course, the same root, uh, in other words, in pious purifications. So the, it was a generic feature of Dionysiac rite that it had this, as it were, uh, letting off of emotional steam or taming of uh, uh, disruptive emotions function. So it makes all the sense in the world that tragedy in particular as a Dionysian right would have had that function. But this is a long story, so I won't go into it further here. The final important step in the development of a historicist theory of genre that I want to discuss briefly involved a certain major broadening of the whole theory and was taken by August Böck in the 19th century, the great uh, student of, of, of Schleiermacher and, and uh, classical philologist in his own right. Up to this point, we've just been concerned with genre as an essential aspect of um, uh, linguistic and non-linguistic art, one whose correct identification is indispensable for both the proper interpretation and the proper evaluation of such art. The genre plays this sort of role in linguistic art, literature, was already recognized by Aristotle in the Poetics and has been recognized by a long tradition. As we've seen, the insight that genres also, also plays this sort of role in non-linguistic art was one of Herder's contributions in the 18th century when he extended it to sculpture, for example. However, Burke, in his Encyclopedia and Methodology of the Philological Sciences, published in 1877, went much further than this. He implied that genre plays an essential role in virtually all communication and therefore also in the proper interpretation and evaluation thereof. For Buck included the identification of genre as one of four essential aspects of all interpretation that he distinguished and insisted on. Burke's point has since been embraced by a significant number of other theorists of interpretation, such as Hirsch, uh, Fowler, Todorov, and Bakhtin, though not, unfortunately, he said markedly, by Anglophone philosophers. And it's perfectly correct. In particular, not only artistic or literary texts essentially have genres that need to be identified if the texts are to be properly understood or evaluated, but also non-artistic texts do so. Genres include not only the epic poem, the ode, the sonnet, the tragedy, the novel, and so on, but also the history book, the scientific article, the newspaper report, the newspaper editorial, the advice column, the instruction manual, the shopping list, the love letter, and so on and so forth. And not only texts essentially have genres that need to be identified if they're to be properly understood or evaluated, but oral uses of language do so as well. Genres include not only all of the things that I've just mentioned, but also the military command, the instruction to an employee, the prayer, the, con the confession, the paternal advice, the request for information, the casual conversation, the narration of an interesting incident, the political stump speech, the joke, and so on. In short, virtually all, or indeed even simply all, communication, whether artistic or not, whether written or spoken, whether linguistic or non-linguistic, essentially involves an intention, however implicit or vague, to instantiate some genre or other. And in order to understand or evaluate the, commu the communication properly, it's essential to identify 
not only such other things as the meanings involved, the concepts involved, or the illocutionary forces, illocutionary forces involved, but also its genre. Consequently, the sort of historicist theory of genre that Voltaire and Herder first developed in the end applies not only to linguistic art or to art in general, but to all communication. The theory's relevance thus ultimately turns out to be vastly broader and its importance vastly greater than they may initially have seemed to be. And that's the lesson for contemporary philosophy of language that hasn't yet learned. Thank you. Ah. Um, and I was very interested in the first bit of your talk when you're talking about um, when you're talking about Shakespeare and Voltaire and Shakespeare. And just as a point of interest, you probably know this already, but Voltaire actually imported Shakespeare to a French culture, and he was so dead certain that the French would see what a hopeless playwright this was that he thought he could have Shakespeare staged in Paris and you know make a laughing stock out of his drama. But of course the opposite happened, the French loved Shakespeare, and Shakespeare kind of entered Germany, I think, from France rather than from England. So the first translations of Shakespeare into German by von Bock, for example, were all in Alexandrines. And um, the um, soliloquists were taken out because mm -hmm. they were seen to be, to be undramatic. So when Herder turns to Shakespeare, there is already a discussion of you know, how are we going to deal with Shakespeare? Is this really a tragedy? Is, uh, is this really drama? And um, you know, two points in that, um, in that context. Um, one is that I think you can see a shift with Herder. He brings something original into this discussion in that he not only fo focuses on form, which Lessing and von Gastenberg had, had already done. But he also focuses on content. He pays attention to the dialects of people on stage, to the fact that people of all classes are represented, and um, to the fact that there are supernatural phenomena which would not be allowed for within the, within the context of French classicism. That seems to be his, his general um, contribution. And the second point I want to make is that, at least as I read Herder, his idea is not simply that we need to read Shakespearean drama within its own context, namely that of the Elizabethan age, but also that if we are good readers of Shakespearean drama, of modern drama, then we may go back and revisit Greek drama and see aspects of Greek drama that is there and was there all the time, but we weren't able to see it because we always viewed Greek drama through the lens of, of classicism or French classicism. Right. Um, yeah, the, the last point is, you know, of course, central to what I was saying. I mean, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's indeed Herder's contribution to point out that they're different genres and that if you assimilate one to the other, I mean, it, of course, Shakespeare's the one he thinks tends to be most misunderstood in his own time, but it, of course it would apply conversely too. If you start out with modern expectations from the France or whatnot, or not, and go back to the Greeks, you're going to falsely assimilate the cases and misunderstand the Greeks. And that, that's, that's very much implicit in, in, in the false assimilation problem that I was talking about. Um, the, the other two points, um, yes, Voltaire in the uh, essay on epic poetry um, is, uh, as the title <laughs> would lead you to think, talking mainly about epic, but he also talks about tragedy and he makes it clear that the, the, the same point he's making uh, about the mutability of, of genres under the same name, making it look like there's one genre where in fact there are multiple, um, that this point applies as much to tragedy as it does to epic poetry. So um, it's not as though Herder um, was flying in the face of Voltaire on that general issue on the case, in the case of tragedy or introducing something completely new in including tragedy in that story. Um, 
The, on, on the other issue about form, yeah, I mean, there, there is this tradition of uh, genre theory. Um, Fowl, the best, the, the, by far the best book on genre theory that exists, uh, current book, um, is a book by Fowler called Kinds of Literature. It's an extraordinarily good book. And one of the, the topics that he's very interested in is how much genre theory has um, worked on the assumption that uh, genres will have to be defined, if at all, in formal terms rather than in terms of content or theme or material or whatever the contrasting term would be. And um, uh, so there has been a tradition of genre theory that has taken that view, a certain tradition. Uh, Goethe was a case in point uh, in the West, West Oestlich of a Divan and thought that you could kind of by juggling the various uh, possible uh, combinations of formal features come up with the only possible set of genres. Uh, and uh, so against that tradition, Herder does indeed, as you say, stand against that tradition. I mean, or rather, uh, 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 Herder does indeed have no sympathy with that tradition. So, for example, when he implies that um, uh, ancient tragedy had this Dionysiac function, that's an aspect of, as it were, the content, it's a theme or something, content, uh, on the content side rather than on the purely formal side. Um, so um, he certainly takes that view. Now, whether Voltaire is guilty of that sort of formalism, not so clear. Um, I mean, there is a tradition in genre theory that does have this formalism, let's say Goethe as an example. Um, whether Voltaire is quite so narrow. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Thanks. Um, no, it's for the recording. Oh. Okay. Huh. You want to be immortalized, don't you? <laughs> I, I was. Uh, <clears throat> there was. It seemed to me you were very interested in questions of genre theory and so on, but I, I was very left in the dark about exactly how you historically wanted to locate this because there's a <coughs> long tradition before Schla the Schlegel brothers, before Herder, well, no, no, right around Herder's time I should say, but I'm thinking of the Sturm und Drang and I'm thinking of people like Lenz or Hamann and there's other figures as well and for them there, there is no genre. Genre is neither here nor there. And they want to get rid of all the rules and all yeah. this entirely. Yeah. So, yeah. And in fact, from that point of view, the Schlegel brothers and even Herder seem to be almost reactionary, or certainly very conservative. And I, so my question is, is what was what what was their attitude towards the Stormer and Dringer? Right. And, and, and he, the question really begs for an answer in the case of Absolutely. Like Herder, but really yeah. used to be Hamann who you know, wants to just sort of happily get rid of all the yeah. rules. Yeah. And uh, so, so I just, I just want to know how you want to locate your people if you see them. It seemed at first as if you wanted to say these guys were really at the forefront of things. In fact, I don't think that was the case at all. They, they seem to me to be more in the tradition of Lessing, who's, who of course is famously fighting against the Sturmer Dinger. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Hamburger Dramaturgie, uh, where right. he's constantly doing battle with them. Right. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've talked about this at quite a bit of length in the After Herder book, and it's just a different uh, artic set of articles. Um, the, the book on genre, the article on genre in there, Herder's genre here, and there is largely about that topic. Um, the a few points about this. Um, Herder is certainly on this side of things. He wants to say that um, even uh, the, the, his considered view, and, and his view most of the time, is that even when an individual author does something that is quite <coughs> unprecedented in terms of genre, um, he's still doing one of two things, not the other. He's inventing a new genre, yeah. not leaving genre behind. Mm. So this is his way of characterizing individuality. Mm. New set of rules are being invented and so on. And, um, you know, that's an interesting view. I mean, it, it, it could sound, if one didn't think long enough about it, incoherent. I mean, doesn't a genre imply multiple instantiation? Mm. 
<coughs> rather than just sort of once create them. But of course, that's, that's, that's a mistake um, because, as, as Burke pointed out explicitly, um, genre, while it may require multiple instantiability, doesn't require multiple, in, multiple instantiation. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is Herder's way of characterizing this sort of uh, originality. Um, now, that's one point to make. Another point to make, though, is that there's a big difference between the issue of um, what people have done in the past and how we should interpret it or evaluate it, on the one hand, and then what we should do in the future. Even if it were the case that we ought to stop working with genres, that wouldn't obviously invalidate uh, this as a hermeneutic of past oh, works. Um, so uh, I think Herder is inclined, as I say, to say that it's not even probably the right way to think about inventiveness for the future. Um, but even if you could get an, a debate going on that score, you know, and, and, and think that it really was good to leave genre behind, that wouldn't invaluate, invalidate any of this as a characterization of what past literary works, other kinds of works have been like, and what one needs to do as an interpreter in order to interpret them properly and evaluate them. And uh, so those are, those are a couple of points. Um, I mean, it's one way of making, going back to the, another way of going back to the first point would be just to, to, to note that um, while it's true that um, not only uh, people uh, like Harman and uh, others uh, in the Sturm und Drang era, and, uh, but also the Romantics, sometimes seem to think in terms of Friedrich Schlegel, sometimes, for example, seems to think in terms of leaving genre behind. Um, <clears throat> when you think about what they, they do, they, they recommend, well, we fuse all the genres or we, 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 can, we blur the, the lines between genres. Uh, when we think back to that, and insofar as it was actually realized, what do we think? Well, that's an interesting genre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I, I'm very sympathetic to yeah. these replies, right. to Schlegel and Herder's replies. But one thing you, we, one has to keep in mind in the context of thinking about genre is by the end of the century, it completely disappears. And you get the idea that the idea of an aesthetic rule is completely gone. And you, you look at Collingwood, and look at Croce, and look at Tolstoy, they have no time for this at all. Yeah, and, 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 and it's a very and, and in a way yes. the Sturm and Drang one is yes. battle. And I, well, one I, in but one in which sense? I mean, one in the sense of influencing more people, corrupting more people, or in the sense, well, well, in the of, in the sense I, of getting I, it right. I think right. in the latter yeah. sense. I mean, yeah. I'm not sympathetic to this yeah. point yeah. of view. I'm, yeah. I'm one who defends aesthetic rules, right? But uh, they're regarded as a complete uh, by by so many modern thinkers. And, and if you go up to Danto, this, this tradition has maintained itself up to the, you know, the end of the 20th century. Yes, but the, the, there is a strong counter-tradition. I mentioned people like Fry and Scholes and so on, uh, Todorov and Bakhtin um, and uh, Hirsch. And, I mean, there's a, there is a strong counter-tradition of more enlightened people. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know yeah. about these people. Yeah. I thought I was standing in <laughs> Yeah, there's not, I mean, there is, of course, this tendency to conflate uh, commitment to genre with a kind of conservatism. Yeah. But that's completely misguided, right? I mean, it would be a bit like saying, well, you know, you really oughtn't when you communicate to confine yourself to using meanings, because that's such a conservative thing. Right? It's not conservative at all. It's a necessary condition of communication, A. And B, you can always invent new meanings, new concepts. So it's a confusion, that idea. So there are two names left on my list. First, uh, you know, sorry. Sorry? Uh, minus one minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's plenty of time. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, my, my first question was different. I'll ask two small questions. The first one comes out of your response to Fred, which is, I would like to hear again the difference between instantiability and instantiation. I, I was, that sounded interesting, but I didn't understand it. 
maybe I wasn't listening carefully. And the second one concerns um, Schlegel's reading of Herder and when when you place that and whether it has to do anything with Schlegel's change of mind after when he starts looking back and, and describes his early writings and his early work on aesthetics as a rage for objectivity and whether there's a kind of, this is when he read Herder and realized, oh, the standards are much more uh, uh, mutable than I had originally thought. Is there a connection there, a historical ah. connection? Yeah, well, I t I'll take the latter question first. And uh, that, yes, I, in fact, what I argue in the article I mentioned, uh, it's in the uh, De Actualité de Romantic volume, is, is, is that it was indeed looking back at Herder's genre theory and his, um, as it were, um, liberalism about different genres and each of them having standard of its own, standards of its own, and there being a real problem about trying to evaluate works from different genres against one another or different genres against one another. It's really when he gets that point from Herder, from the Letters to the Advancement of Humanity, which he was reviewing actually in between first writing the, um, on the, Greek, the history of Greek poetry, uh, on the, um, uh, not on the history of Greek poetry, on the study of Greek poetry in 1795 and writing this revolutionary preface that he added in 1797 where he eventually, essentially becomes a romantic doing a 180 degree turn from having been a neoclassicist. He reviewed the Les for the Advance of Humanity on this topic in, in the middle and uh, I think that was indeed the crucial impetus, or one of the crucial impetuses among one or two others um, that moved him to this romanticism about, uh, that of course made his career, made his name. Um, so that's on, on the first issue. On the, on the other issue, the point was really very simple that, um, you, you know, it can sound, if one hears it quickly, incoherent to say, as Herder is saying, that um, an author might invent a genre for one work, which he only uses in that one work. So it's a new genre, never occurs anywhere else before or afterwards. Um, but it's not incoherent, right? Because although there may be a conceptual requirement of multiple instantiability, that's to say there could have been other, could have been other works in this genre, there's no conceptual requirement that there actually were other works in this genre. So it's, it's, not, it's not incoherent to say, as, as uh, Danson, for example, in his very, very good book on, 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 Sh on Shakespeare's dramatic genres, who plays up this inventiveness with genre in Shakespeare and how works often, that are sometimes classified as history plays or, 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 or tragedies, actually are kind of sui generis in genre within Shakes even Shakespeare's corpus. It's not incoherent to call those genres just because they only happen once. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a question about the, uh, the application of uh, your renew, re renewal of the concept of genre to philosophy itself. I mean, right. of course, there are all these genres, right? I mean, I'm currently asking a question. We publish journal articles. Right. We publish books and so forth. And now there might be, you know, like it's quite open-ended, you know, like what about the beer conversation? And the, according to this concept of genre, they would all count as genres. I, I would be happy with that. But now there's, there, I think there's a tendency to associate the concept of genre with uh, quite a few worries, uh, such as, you know, like genres seem to have a, a life of their own. So, you know, like maybe ha being forced to write 20 pages journal articles somehow, you know, shapes my philosophical thinking, regardless of, you know, the very best intentions I may fail of making the point. So, uh, this, mm. this is one, you know, set of worries, I think, that are typically associated with, with the very idea Mm. 
Yeah, both very, very good questions. I think lovely questions. Yeah, on on the liberal on on the the, the first uh, question of whether um, genre doesn't, uh, as it were, constrain you to commit to things that you might really not want to commit to. Um, I, th I think that is true, and and um, you know that's why it's very important um, that one has the freedom to, freedom to opt against or f a genre or for a new genre or to create a new genre, um, modify the rules, change the rules in various ways, add to the rules, subtract them, um, create a new genre. I mean, that, so that's one reason why. Um, that's important, you know, because the, the, there can indeed be constraints. If you were locked into a single genre, that would typically entail a whole lot in, by way of commitments. Uh, so it's important that we have this ability to change. Um, so th that, that's on the first question. Now, the second question is really a very interesting question about the vagueness in the concept itself. And um, I mean, here, here's, here's, here are a couple of things I would say about this. First of all, I think it's a mistake to think of genres as just, as it were, instruments of taxonomy. So something that somebody comes to a work from the outside with and uses in order to classify the work along with certain other works and so on. No, genres are a means of communication used by authors and thereby useful as ways of classification or taxonomic principles, very much in the way that concepts are. You know, um, if I'm an author who is writing about history, then I will be using the concept of myself as a means of communication, articulation that I use myself, but then I can also be classified as somebody who talks about history. Right? So that's the, stru that's the way genres are, it's that I think is important. Um, so that, for example, limits the propriety of um, uh, the range of things that might properly be appealed to as genres in relation to a certain work. There are interesting questions, incidentally, there's a footnote on this issue, about um, whether and if so, in what sense it makes uh, it's nonetheless proper to describe a work which wasn't deliberately intended to instantiate a genre as nonetheless doing so. For example, people sometimes talk about the Iliad as tragedy, or as the tragedy of Achilles. Um, although clearly, Homer did not have the concept of tragedy. It wasn't invented for several centuries. No. Well, none of the authors who had an input in the, into the Iliad, let's say, whether it was one or many, um, uh, had the concept of a, a tragedy, because it didn't exist yet. So there are interesting issues of that kind. Um, but in any case, uh, on vagueness, this is a very tricky thing. And it gets back to the whole issue of formalism. And because there's a temptation here um, in this area, as in so many areas of philosophy, uh, among philosophers, to um, assume that, if you, you, that a concept can only be legitimate, as it were, fully legitimate, if you have a definition of it. Um, and that is you know, one of the many mistakes our profession has made since Socrates and Plato. And uh, fortunately since Locke and Wittgenstein with family resemblance concepts and so on, we ought to be less susceptible to make that, making that mistake. So any notion that definition is somehow a requirement for a clear concept is a mistake. It's just a philosophical mistake. So, so that shouldn't be the form in which that question is going to be put. Um, but, the, of course, one can still raise the question, well, but um, what kinds of characteristics go into deciding where, whether a particular case is or is not a member of this genre category? And there, um, you, the answer is probably going to be you know, quite complicated, and it's in particular not going to uh, observe this distinction between formality and content that I was referring to earlier. Uh, so some genres are going to be in essentially involve features of content as part of what makes them uh, works the, the instances of that, those genres, uh, at least as necessary conditions. And um, so uh, it's a, the answer in, is probably going to end up. My, I think the answer is going to probably end up being something like the answer. You know, what makes something isn't the concept of a, a game vague. Uh, 
Um, what makes something a game? Well, you know, as Wittgenstein told us, um, that's a family resemblance concept, and uh, there, are no, there is no set of necessary and sufficient conditions that you could give, not even in principle could you give it, not even in the form of a complicated disjunction, you know, features A, B, C, or C, D, E, or F, G, H, not even that way could you give necessary and sufficient conditions for it. Uh, all you can do is sort of point to the overlapping features between individual cases that make them instances of the case. Uh, and so it's going to be that kind of a situation, I take it. And uh, the, the, the upshot will then be, well, a concept that worked like that could be, well could be clear or it could not be clear. And there are ways perhaps of discriminating the two cases, for example, train some people, lock them up in, a, in two rooms, feed them new examples, and if they, all, they come to agreement in their classification, that's a pretty good indication that you've got a fairly clearly, a clear concept. If they diverge all over the place, then perhaps not. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a subtle and difficult story that has to be told. It's a very good question. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you.